Hi, I am Ada Fabano. Um, I am so glad that you all are joining us, continually following us for the San Antonio Black International Film Festival, our wonderful magical theme, Animation in Black. Um, today, we are going to bring in illustrators um, that work heavily in the industry. They're very widely known in their, and respected in their profession. And just talk to them about their world uh, what what that entails as artists, um, and just get some insight into the world of illustration. So I'd like to bring from from Philly, <laughs> the infamous Eric Battle, and from Montreal, Canada, we have Jose Holder. Welcome, gentlemen. What's up? Hello. What's up? Thanks for having us. Oh, thank you. Because I know um, Eric, every time I talk to Eric, it's like, oh, I got so much going on. And so it's wonderful that you all could be with us today. It's a pleasure. Uh, just for, for me, it's always very important. To, uh huh? It's a pleasure. Oh, I thought you said. Okay, good. Uh, for me, it's always very important to, to get a sense of who you are, wh what your background is, and how you kind of ventured into the to the world of illustration and art and you know everything that you do i know it's a mixture of a whole bunch of mediums that you that you work with but let's um eric let's start let's start with you philly philly homegrown um <laughs> and just tell us a little bit about yourself your background where you're from how you got into um illustrations all right well again thank you for having me uh um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and, and speaking with you both, um, I, yeah, I, I've, I've admired both of your, your works for a while. Um, but yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Eric Battle. Uh, I'm an illustrator. I live here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I, my, my interest in, in art and illustration started, I'd say when I was probably about like five or six years old. Uh, I remember I remember going to the corner store with my mother and seeing a rack of comic books and I ran over and I'm looking, you know, looking at these things and I'm just like amazed at the color and the, the drawings and the, all of the action. And like really <laughs> from there, it was a it was a love affair at, at you know, at first sight. So, um, you know, I, uh, you know, my mother, she she bought me a couple of, of comic books and you know, I was just transfixed uh, from that moment on, um, where whereby my like my sisters and friends would be outside playing. I would, you know, I'd I'd be in my room, and as as long as I had like a, a couple of sheets of paper and a pencil, I was I was in my own world. And uh, you know, so I started off, you know, trying to copy the drawings, of course. Um, At and five. What's that? At five years old. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then, you know, I got, I got, I got tired of like copying the drawings and, I, you know, I, and I started to think about like, well, how are, how are these, you know, how are these images being made? Um, and so again, my, my mother, she, she recognized that I was, you know, that, that the artwork held my interest. So she started to like enroll me in different, like, you know, youth art classes and things like that. Um, and again, like sometimes she would bring me a, just a ream of paper and just getting a, a, a stack of like blank paper was like Christmas to me. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's like, yeah, I guess, you know, pretty low maintenance kid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, from there, you know, I, I, I uh, I attended University of the Arts in here in Philadelphia, graduated from there uh, with a degree in illustration. Um, the thing is, when I was in when I was in college, when I was in college, I, I kind of wanted to steer away from comic books. I because I, you know, in my head, I wanted to, I wanted to like, I wanted to paint. I wanted to mm -hmm. paint like Time magazine covers and you know, illustrate like uh album, you know, album cover artwork and things like that. Uh -huh. um, but as when I was a, as a student in in an art college, uh -huh. I recognized that the teachers 
kind of look down on comic books, but really? at the same time, yeah, because it wasn't, they weren't considered high art, you know? Um, so the thing is, I did recognize that to draw comic books, I needed to know how to draw everything. You know, I, had, I needed to learn perspective and anatomy, mm -hmm. storytelling, you know, I needed to know how to, you know, just how to put together all of these scenes. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I kind of went back to, to like that being the, I guess the, the, the main thrust of my artwork, because I recognized with, with, with those skills, I, I had a bit of a leg up on some of the other students who were only focused on like drawing still life, mm -hmm. you know, paintings, things like that. Um, and, and like, I didn't have to, I didn't always need a model to draw a figure. So, um, you know, I kind of leaned back into that. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the time I graduated in 89, um, a lot of, a lot of the, the fields of illustration that I was interested in previously had kind of like, they were kind of dying out. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that again, in comic books, you know, there's architecture, there's graphic design, there's fashion design, um, you know, all of these elements that I was, that I was interested in anyway. Um, but like, if, like if I, if I was doing children's books and I, you know, I'd done, I'd done some children's book work for a while, but mm -hmm. in all of these other fields, they were kind of limiting and you were kind of like pigeonholed into doing one thing, one particular thing. Uh -huh. So I was like, well, okay, comic books, I can, I can do everything that I want to do. And, you know, wow. in one, in one medium. So, yeah, that's. Uh, I don't think people even realize the skill that it takes to get just a frame of comic. I mean, I don't think people, what you just said blew me away. I know it, it was, but that you have graphic arts, you have architecture, you have, you have all that in a in a single frame of a comic book. So we're going to talk about yeah. that. That's interesting. Yeah. It's really interesting. So um, what about you, um, Jose, in terms of um, in terms of your background, where you grew up? In, um, I know you're in Montreal now, but are you from the States or you're from Canada? Actually, I was born in uh, London, England <sighs> and uh, grew up in L.A. and then skipped over here. Uh, with my with my mom mm -hmm. to Montreal and uh, yeah my journey began here I guess mm -hmm. but it's funny because my formative years are all in LA so it's kind of weird it's kind of weird that's what I what I call home in a sense you okay know? so I mean so so tell us about growing up were, were you a, were you a prodigy too or you discovered yourself <laughs> reading it? well first of all thanks for having me it's really great You're to welcome. be here. Um, I don't do a lot of these, so this is a lot of fun. It's great to make, meet Eric. I know I had to coax you. I was like, come on, Jose, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you had to, yeah, yeah. But thank you, thank you for doing that. And um, for introducing me to Eric. I think we're gonna have a lot of great discussions in the future. So my story, um, my name is Jose Holder and I'm an illustrator slash director slash uh, writer producer here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And my story is so similar to Eric's, it's not even funny. Um, <laughs> when I first came to this country with my mom, as I understand this being retold to me as an adult, <laughs> there was some unease for me as a, as, a, as a youngster, I think about four, the age of four is when I, uh, I came over here. And as I understand it, uh, my mom had bought me, um, you know, those spinner rack days way back when, when you would find uh, like a surprise pack with like three comic books, surprise, you didn't know what they were. Cracker Jacks? It, it's sort of like that, but it was a, it could be in a paper bag or just yeah. something that was obscure so you wouldn't see what the prizes were inside. Uh -huh. And I would, I remember opening it and seeing three comics. I think one was like a, a Richie Rich, one was a DC comic and one was a Wonder Woman comic. Um, and from that point, I was smitten. I mean, as an only child, you sort of retreat into your own worlds, you know? And as a child of the 70s, uh, 
I mean, really, was there ever a better period for television and film? And <laughs> so we grew up on some crazy, crazy TV. And um, it, it really piqued my imagination. Uh, shows like um, uh, The Other Side, mm -hmm. um, you know, am Amazing Stories, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. I immediately became a horror buff. Hmm. And uh, I started drawing really early, uh, just as Eric said, copying a lot of the works I had seen. And uh, very soon, like probably grade one or grade two, I started to get a little bit of feedback. And as creatures of habit, we sort of gravitate towards what we're validated for, right? So I, I, I could see that people responded to artwork. And so I kept doing it. But back then, um, I didn't know anything about comic book conventions. I don't know if they were any back then, but um, there wasn't a community of people that I could access to know what the, you know, what the scope of my, um, uh, what the possibilities were for us right. as illustrators. So going to school, you sort of create these little, these, these tiny groups, these niches with other illustrators and, um, comic book stores were up and about at that time and i would spend hours at a time sitting on the floor of comic book stores just oh, wow you know what i mean um they'd have to kick me out because i didn't have any money <laughs> i would just <laughs> i would just love going through that stuff and wow um i think what happened i mean high school happened right and you get sidetracked and you realize that a lot of artists are being pulled in different direction, maybe by their parents or just by life in general. And uh, you become an island onto yourself, at least I did. Uh, so I tried to figure out at the time, when you're in those early formative years, what can I do with my illustration mm -hmm. to make money? What's my job gonna be? Um, what can I uh, register for in college or university? Mm -hmm. And so architecture was one of those things that I had at the back of my mind to keep the pencil in my hand. Um, like Eric, I mean, we know we have a leg up, right? We have a tiny advantage. And for a time, uh, I went through an architectural program. Hmm. And I graduated from that with a degree. But we keep getting called back, right? Hmm. To, to that loose, organic, creative line work. and. By that time, I, I had access to friends who were part of bullpens. And it's then that I realized that the, the power in community was very, very important. And I think it still exists to this day. It's really mm -hmm. important to know who your extended brothers and sisters are um, from every background in the industry. And um, I still couldn't figure out a way to make a living from it because for the most part, that market was um an american market mm. whether on the east or west coast but i didn't have money to do any to you know travel back mm -hmm. back and forth so uh it was all about manila envelopes and photocopying and <laughs> eric's laughing oh, yeah know, yeah a lot of money was spent sending packages to the big two and, and wow. other companies and in the meantime i uh i took up uh, contracts doing graphic arts uh, after the architectural stint. And soon after that, I opened up my own school for uh, illustration. Something happened um, that sparked something for me. I think it's one of the questions you were going to ask, but I'm going to jump in early. Uh, I had to, to relearn art in a sense that allowed me to access all of the things that Eric was talking about. Um, facial features, anatomy, clothing, lighting, all that stuff. Hmm. And so I went back to the basics of uh, stick form. And I sort of like recreated a system for myself. And when I realized I had something special, I shared it with my friends who were also illustrators. And they were like, listen, you have to do something with this. You have to share it. And so I, I opened up a little school. And during that period, um, for about 10 years or so, we had hundreds of students come through. And we just taught the funda fundamentals of illustration. Right. This was in LA then. This was in LA. This is in Montreal. In oh, this is in Montreal. Montreal. You're back in Montreal. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that period, I got exposed to 
uh, storyboarding for television and film. And that's when I sort of diversified my, uh, my portfolio in a sense. And uh, I always held on to entertainment, film, television as my, my muse. And so it was, I mean, the, the cinematic quality mm -hmm. uh, translated very well to comic books. And so it was easy to sort of tell stories in that medium. Yeah. And um, yeah, I sort of made a career as a storyboard artist and now as a concept artist in video games. And I've ended up at uh, Warner Brothers Games, Montreal. Nice. Wow. Me. I mean, fascinating. I'm like, I opened up a little school. Like, how do you open up a school? <laughs> like, like that, that, that's major. That's but major. it started off as a bullpen. It started, I knew I wanted to open up a school, but I also had some extra space to bring in other artists because I understood the power in community right. and sort of like feeding off each other's energy, right? Mm -hmm. And some of them would teach, some of them would just stay in the back and work on DC or Marvel comics or whatever. And I got to learn from them at the same time. So it was great. Mm, a lot of synergy there. That's right. Yeah. So it seemed like you all were supported i talk i've been talking to some other people and the parents no you have to be a doctor you have to be a doctor. so you didn't it didn't seem like you you had the support of your mothers you didn't seem like it seemed like they recognized what you had the gifts you had early on and supported you so you all were very blessed in that sense that you didn't get scared away um uh, screwed away from that i mean were the animators the nerds were the illustrators the nerds i mean of the school of school <laughs> Absolutely. I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Y'all were growing you up. Say, you Eric? are awkward teens, yeah. kind of like in your own world, because you had shit going on in your head <laughs> all the time while everybody else was doing their thing. Yeah, I, I'd say absolutely. You know, um, because again, it's like the thing is, so like I was, I was a quiet kid anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but so in, in like in grade school, I was quiet, and I was the sh at one, you know, at for. A, a period of time I was the shortest kid in the class. But the thing is, I recognized that because I could draw, the other kids like kind of accepted you. They were yeah, they were they were they were they were, they were drawn to me. And then so like you know when I found you know my group of friends who we, we all like comic books, you know, so that you know those were the connecting tissues between you know between the 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 disparate groups of people in 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 like especially in grade school and and, and in high school also mm -hmm. um you know it was very very quiet in high school because to me it was like i was just i could be in a crowd of people but and i just like to watch i just like to watch people how they interacted you know movements you know th this is that was the stuff that i was always paying attention to yeah. you know um wow so what i mean in terms of i don't know how did you get into the the comic book realm i mean i know you you grew up with comic books you, you started with comic books but <clears throat> the trajectory of moving into that realm where you where you actually had opportunities to turn this into something lucrative and, and career oriented um with your drawings i mean how did how did that start from school or from from your school or whatever what introduced you into because it's, it's i mean you have to get in you have to get your foot in the door at yeah. some point so how was yeah that's well that starts with the conventions okay and so like in in philadelphia there were there were always conventions so you know just again finding out like doing whatever research you could at the time you know uh you know well before google and everything like that but mm -hmm. you know finding out about conventions um, you know, I remember like the first time I had gone to a convention in, in here in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, just actually seeing that there were actual like editors there. Um, and so a lot of it, a lot of it for me was kind of just like learning as you go. Cause I didn't, I didn't know anybody in, the, you know, at least in the early years, I didn't know anybody who was actually, you know, working in the industry. Um, but you know, you would you would kind of like read some of the uh, I would I would buy some of the the comic book um, magazines okay. like magazines about the industry, you know. So you you know reading interviews of 
uh, of different comic book artists. And, you know, they would talk about how, you know, they would they would take their portfolios up to New York. Um, if, you know, if they, you know, if they lived in Canada, you know, uh, you know, or, or, you know, other cities, you know, they, they would go to New York. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get a portfolio together and mm -hmm. I'm gonna get up to New York and, and, you know, hope somebody pays attention. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, you know, the conventions. Um, so the, 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 the very first time I sent, so, well, well okay. Like rolling back, it's like, mm -hmm understanding that you had to put together a portfolio pack at least a package of of sequential pages to show an editor or an art director um so you know it's like you would work on you know i i, I worked on like uh, five to six sequential pages mm -hmm. at the you know the my first my first sample packet that i sent out I had drawn a story. It was like Silver Surfer versus Thor because they were my favorite characters. And I sent them into Marvel and I got a response from an editor. The thing, and he sent, he, you know, he, he liked what I sent in, but um, he sent me, a, he sent me a script and I, you know, I didn't, I guess it was a sample script, but they don't tell you, they don't tell you what to do. So I was like, okay, I guess they don't, they don't tell you, they, they really don't tell you anything. He didn't tell me like what he was looking for in a, in a, in a time frame or anything. No direction, no direction. Uh -huh. no direction. So what I did, I, I was like, okay, I picked out like a five page sequence, but again, because they don't tell you any kind of time frame, I, you know, I was like, oh, I, I need to get this done as quickly as possible. And I rushed it where, and you know, it's like thinking. Yeah, you know, I did. I didn't take the time to like make sure everything, like the perspective, was correct, and Please. all of those things. Because I'm thinking, oh, they must want this back right away. Mm -hmm. So again, I you know, I was excited to get a, a response the first time out, mm -hmm. but when I rec when I realized that what I sent back in was not up to par because you don't they don't give you a response you don't get a response if if the stuff isn't right if they don't want it mm -hmm. yeah they don't want it uh -huh. so i you know it's like i was kind of crushed but i realized it was it was it was definitely a learning experience because i spent the next couple of years trying to like get a response again so it's like i would i would go to work you know, I was working at hotels or, you know, just whatever jobs I could, I could get. This was in your twenties. Yeah. Yeah. Like in college and, you know, out of college, mm -hmm. you know, like, Oh yeah, I want to, I want to do this. So, um, you know, I would, I would go to work and, you know, sometimes I would get off work late at night, but I would go home and sit up, you know, just trying to think of another like five page sequence. Cause I was, I was like, okay, well, I, I've got to show anatomy. I've got to show, perspective. I've, I've got to show storytelling, um, you know, the acting of the characters and, you know, start, you know, uh, teaming up with other friends who were also trying to get into the industry. You know, you, you know, we all start to learn like, you know, what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are. And, you know, we, you know, try to help each other. It's like, okay, hey, you know, you need to work on your faces, your, your, your facial yeah. expressions, all of those things. And, and, and basically it's, it's like being, a movie director on a on a piece of paper. Wow, that's you're making all of those decisions of like where the, where is the lighting coming from? You know what? Where's the camera angle coming from? You know all of those things. Um, so yeah, I spent I spent a number of years trying to get back, trying to get into the industry where you know, um, and again it was just just a learning curve. So thankfully, like I was I was starting to get other illustration work in doing like newspaper editorial cartoons and illustrations. Again, I did some fashion stuff. I was doing some children's book stuff, but, but, you know, again, learning, like kind of navigating through those different, uh, fields. Mm -hmm. Again, it was, I was like, yeah, I don't want to, yeah, I had done some children's book stuff for a while and I had gotten, I had gotten, a, um, an offer from Hallmark to do like, 
you know, greeting cards. Cause I was like, oh, and again, I, you know, I wanted to do it, to do everything, but I was like, okay, to do greeting cards, but they wanted, I think they were located in like Kansas or something. So you had to move out there. But then I was like, mm -hmm. I don't want to draw fuzzy animals all day. You know? <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to, again, concentrate on comic books. And, um, you know, I went to conventions and things like that. And, uh, you know, so, so that's a good piece to know for someone young and wanting to get into, you know, bright eyed, bushy tail once again, to start with conventions. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause you, you meet people there, you get opportunities, but one thing that has changed so drastically, cause as I listen to you, I'm like, damn, these kids nowadays, all they gotta do is get a link to a website. <laughs> And yes. I mean, life yeah. in terms of the technology and where it has brought illustrators and so many other professions is night and day. You used to have to walk the pavement and, and, and hand things in and go to the post office and hustle. go to the rock machine, as, as Jose said. Yeah, you had to um, hustle. Yeah. How, how, no. to what extent has that, has that uh, changed your world? And what was the, I guess, what, what the learning curve? from you being old school, which is a good thing, to, to having to, to deal with the technology and learn the technology, cross over into the technology and all that it can do for you as an as an illustrator. I, I think the, the hustle remains. It's still the oh, same. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is like most, um, most careers in the arts, it's still a, a personable, you know, game. It's still a a yeah. social there's still a social factor mm -hmm. to figuring out uh what place you want to occupy in the field and uh how you work with others and um, what value you can bring to different types of jobs um so my story is is very close to eric's in the sense that i knew that um so much of how far i could go would depend on my ability to sell myself and to move into different spaces with a certain mm -hmm. amount of confidence, mm -hmm. um, not just in myself, but the work itself, you know? And the work had to be on par, so it meant seeking out people who did this for a living. And that's where the convention thing, like Eric was saying, was so important. Um, I was fairly lucky, because in Montreal, uh, we had a very strong um, illustration sort of community, mm -hmm. and often, we would have like, uh, you know, just to, just get togethers where people would draw together and sort of um, play off each other's work. Um, mm -hmm. And I got to meet a few of those people really early on in, in my career as an illustrator. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's really good because uh, you get a sense of where you sit artistically, um, and in what field you can you can best offer your skill sets and and a lot of the people I knew would sort of hold me to a higher Stand. degree, you uh -huh. know. And you know you got to work on those eyes, you got to work on those hands, and and what are the techniques? And we were we were using mirrors back then, and um, we had uh, I would call them graveyards, uh, basically reference libraries, you know, filling. Um, drawers with all all types of reference we've cut out of magazines and things like that and um the actual comic book magazines were sort of our portal to the industry to the wider industry we understood that there were people out there who were doing this and what their inspirations were you know um where they learned their craft i think that's i mean that's what artists have been doing for generations right you you learn what your, um, the people who you love, you learn what their interests are mm -hmm. and where their inspirations came from. And back then, uh, magazines like Wizard and I think Comic Beat and stuff like that, yeah. they would show us uh, sort of like the underpinnings of a finished comic book page. Mm -hmm. um, and you could really understand better now how you needed to up your game what the line work had to look like, what the the medium demanded of you as a penciler or an inker or an all-in-one. Mm. Um, and then what companies 
uh, had in terms of approaches to the work, you know, what their pipelines were. Mm -hmm. uh, was it draw first and write later? Was it uh, write first and draw after the fact? I mean, sure. I mean, the, just figuring that out and how to tell a story in different ways, I think was really important. And then going to conventions when you have no money, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to figure out how to best present yourself, the whole portfolio thing, spending some money on your craft, Mm -hmm. um, and often you would hear six months, come back in six months, six months to a year. <laughs> I'll see you in six. I got that from Neil Adams and a bunch of other people and you'd be wow. crushed on the yeah. bus back yeah. from yeah. New York. I'd be like six months. That was like 10 years <laughs> for us back then. Yeah. And so, um, I remember sending out packages really early. I mean the, the whole indie um the whole indie sector of illustration of comic books was so robust there were just so many places where you could apply your skill set and learn in real time in mm -hmm. front of everyone like what um, like what i mean like you said the whole independent sector but like what like who what what what, what different companies? Indie comics that were outside of the big two yeah <laughs> right there weren't a lot of companies back then but uh -huh. you could get a lot of work doing a uh, small press stuff or you could put out your own um, ash can, which were really big back then. We would you would actually draw our own pages. And I think I must have logged like three, four hundred of my own personal pages before I started going to conventions, just so I could stand in front of an editor and have some confidence that I wasn't wasting their time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that was that was a huge part of it. Just meeting the extended community, um, learning from them in Artist Alley, you know, uh, what was what was necessary to actually do the job. And I think the big part, the part I would tell my students for years, ask questions about the lifestyle. Because we never knew what were the, <laughs> you know, the, the plights and the pluses of trying to make a career in this and mm -hmm. trying to have a family and dealing with um rejection right uh which is a huge part of entertainment real talk yeah real talk yeah um so many things i th i've just got a whole new there's things people don't even think about like about different professions you don't even think about but eric one thing you said that it's like a movie director on paper that's deep because a movie director has to have the gaffer to light it Mm -hmm. has to have the grip to move things around have to have the the prop person the storyboard artist research the and you have to do all of that one person in your head and, and move it out there i mean that to me is awesome it is it, it can be was. the thing is like working in comics like if you're on a monthly book that's so it's like it's being creative on demand because like a, a monthly book, you know, you're you're like like Jose said, you know, you don't understand until you're in the industry, until you're until you get that first assignment, like you don't understand what you've what you've signed up for. It's like no sleep, you know, but again, it's like you you hope that the ideas like when you're reading, you know, when you're reading through the script, like when I when I get a script, I read through it twice the first time, then I set it aside and, you know, go do whatever else. Then I go, I, I come back to it, read it again, just to make sure I understand what the, what the writer is looking for. Um, and I try to see, and like, as I'm reading through it, I'm hoping that, you know, ideas are sparking right then and there. And, you know, I try to like, you know, sketch those out as quickly as I can, as I'm reading. Um, and then you start to figure out, okay, what is like, I, you know, I always want to be able to give the writer what they're asking for. Which they uh, don't know a lot of times. Well, you know, well, yeah, I mean, there, you know, some, some writers write visually, right. Some don't. So it's the ones that don't, that you've got to like, okay, again, understand at least what, what the thrust of the story is. And then you start to like figure out, okay, how do I how do I get there visually, you know, panel by panel and page by page, mm -hmm. you know, to get to the 
the conclusion of this particular issue. Understanding that, you know, the to me, I you know, I, I always like more more information. I, I at least I, I need the at least the all of the specific information so that I can tell this story effectively. Like if there's if there need to be details in in a in, in the background of a particular panel that are going to show up in a in a later panel or issue, you know. So so you know so that we're setting we're setting up the scene as clearly as possible. And again, that's why like again as a director you have people like setting up your your scenes and backgrounds and all of those things recognizing that everything in the background may mean something for for it, it may be foreshortening for something coming coming uh coming down the, down the line. Mm -hmm. Um so again, you know, you've got you've got to be aware of all of those things. And like I said, you know, you you're the as as an illustrator and 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 comic book storyteller, again, you're you're the one who's picking the the fashions that the characters are wearing. You know, yeah. they're not in costume. You know, it's like, is it a time period piece? Right. Um, you know, the hairstyles, uh, the 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 you know, if it's a uh, street scene, you know, is it is it a is in in the city? You know, are you drawing skyscrapers? Is a, is it a street scene? All of those things. Like, are there pigeons flying in the background? Wow. You know, is there a dog? You know, peeing on the uh, the fire hydrant. All of those things, and because all of those things help help you know people relate to the story. Right. And you want to you want to keep you want to keep their eyes and imaginations engaged, and so like when you know as 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 i was learning to to you know learning the craft of illust being an illustrator you know i remember like making sure i would ask myself a, a set of questions it's like why how where and when because it's like you know when i when i looked at the illustrator like the illustrators works who you know who the stuff that caught my eye I would ask myself, well, why why am I drawn to these particular pieces of illustration and storytelling? And it was because of again all of the details in the background. You know, they paid attention, and I was like, okay, what do I need to do? Once once I once I can like uh, master the the basics, how can I set my work apart from other illustrators? You know, it's like what mm -hmm. you know. What, what is this illustrator over here? What is what is what are the qualities of Jack Kirby's work? How are they different from the qualities of say like Bernie Wrightson or or Barry Windsor Smith or Neil Adams? And you know, so like they each have different qualities to their work. Mm -hmm. Um and again, those are those were the things that caught my eye. And so like, you know, at this at this stage of my 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 I guess career is like you know I want to I want to draw stuff that if I was to see it on the shelf and I didn't know who drew it that I would want to buy. Mm. So that's that's how I approach you know that's how I approach my artwork at this point. I'm glad well, that um no I'm go ahead I, I was going to say I'm glad that you start my next question was to take us through the process when you get a script mm -hmm. the steps and I, I would just like for you two to talk as animators. I mean, you started <clears throat> to tell us, do you do you put yourself in a quiet space? Do you go to a wild a lot of coffee shop? I mean, how do you transform into that story to produce the images that a lot of times, I would say a lot of times the writers may not may be clueless about? And I know in film there's Bibles to that story. They have you know, film Bibles where they they break down the psychology the you know where they were from what were they skin colors or whatever what do you all have is there's not a, a illustrator's bible maybe maybe that's something y'all can develop i don't know but but just kind of walk us through somebody comes in brings you a book or brings you a script what, what well, do they tell you what what is the direction what do they say to you just read my script <laughs> I, I'd love to say that everything begins with the script. I mean, a well-written script 
um, I mean, is, is everything. It's the, it's the, it's the core of everything you're going to build off. And it's, it's always important to sit down with a writer and find out what's in their head and, and how they envision um, the material actually playing out visually. And do you that's do that you're... before or after you read the script? I'm sorry. Do you do you talk with the writer? I always think it's important to talk with the writer before just to get a sense of who they are as an individual and what their proclivities are um, before you read the work, not to be sort of um, not to have an advanced warning of what the, the script is about. It should be able to speak for itself. I mean, they know their craft. Uh, but then to just like Eric said, to be able to go through it and uh, go through it more than once, figure out what your take might be on it mm -hmm. and how you might be able to spin it. Um, for me, uh, as an illustrator, I learned from other illustrators that your toolbox is very important because because you're limited to how you can tell uh, someone else's story or your own by what your visual toolbox is. And so you you have to get a sense as you study other illustrators, which is very important, um, how to draw different types of things. Like Eric was saying, you have your backgrounds, you have your, and we hate backgrounds. When we're younger, it's something that we, <laughs> we stay away from feet and hands, but you, you have to take the time to actually fall in love with these things. Mm. Um, and you know hair and steel and water and different artists have different takes on this you know uh barry windsor's uh, water and maybe uh another artist steel like you know so I, I think you you sort of take from different artists the pieces of um what you envision for yourself as a final product um and and then there are techniques that allow you to tell stories that are really you're, you're taking from film itself, from the cinematic language of film, which is, uh, you know, wide shots versus close ups and ECUs and um, pans. Um, and you have to figure out how to translate that through things like pacing and panel work. Um, maybe grabbing uh, emotional features from your characters to show that they're being pensive or or contemplating something and you have to really get into the head of some of your subjects you know and so um i think reading getting into literature and having a an affinity for just different types of books and magazines and understanding how writers sort of construct their worlds and what language they use to describe visual things, visual cues, uh, I think that that helps in a really big way. Like, I don't know if Eric came to this realization like I did at some point, you realize you have to learn how to draw small, micro versus macro, mm -hmm. because the detail in an eye is very simplified, maybe into one or two lines when it's at a certain distance. So you start studying, how do you draw hair or eyes or hands you know, really, really small. And that helps you to be able to define a writer's story through different types of panels and camera work. And I found when I jumped to advertising and I was a storyboard artist, um, a lot of those shot breakdowns uh, are very clear. You know, you need to know what type of lenses that you might use to capture this story. Oh, wow. it's, it's this, it's a different, set of tools that you're using to tell the same visual work, you know? And so uh, with some directors, it's about action and you have to understand how, how not to break the 180 if you're going through a, a simple conversation between two people or, or four people, um, figuring out uh, things like how lighting can accentuate the story. And break bring that down certain, 180, because of the light. 180, just understanding where, where uh, the, the line is for the camera so that anybody who's on the left side who's having a conversation doesn't in, in the next panel jump to the right side and we sort of get a little confounded mm -hmm. you know confused as a as a viewer or uh, as a reader so just understanding how to to best tell the writer's story and um a big part of that is communication and uh, working together, collaboration. Because like you said, Ada, 
not all writers have that skill set of being able to tell a visual story and they may be very verbose mm -hmm. they may love the exposition um and you sort of have to scale that back to i can't put all of that in one panel i have to stretch it out into three yeah mm. i have to have an action and then a reaction and sometimes in the in the heat of writing that awesome story um things get sort of uh you know mashed together and you have to figure out a way to work with writers to to help them tell the best stories they can yeah. wow so because you both were drawn into this life with comics and now i know eric eric has illustrated stories of popular icons like spider-man x-men young justice and and you have created you know it's, you know similar icons and stuff so what was that like when you saw your drawings brought to life on screen and and, and also growing up with spider-man or you grew up with spider-man you grew up with those draw those people those not people those characters that that you grew up with you're drawing them now and you're drawing them that they're to the point where now everything is action adventure and you know things have gone to the screen what was that like seeing something that you storyboarded or drawn that has been taken and brought to life on film or animation you you want me to take yeah, this one yeah, you. I mean, <laughs> um, you well like for, for me i always knew that there was a very clear almost seamless connection between film and uh an illustration especially comic books because of the cinematic quality of capturing the same types of shots um but of course you're you're limited to that 22 pages or 24 pages or whatever it is and um there's also a quality of being able to expand your work some artists had a lot of um real estate to be able to show what they could do and add detail uh, but you learned right away from the get what type of value you could offer within that time frame. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be really honest with yourself. If it's a page a day, how much detail can you do? Yeah. How much time do you actually have to cross hatch an entire, <laughs> an entire panel? Are you losing four or five hours on that one panel or wow. can you move on and have a semblance of an eight hour day or a 10 hour day? Um, most comic book artists I knew growing up had other jobs. And so this was mainly a side hustle. Right. So uh, you had to be very uh, economical with your choices. And often you would see beautiful, beautifully rendered covers, um, but very uh, clean, very uh, pragmatic line work on the, on the interiors of these books. Um, but you were always held to that higher standard of, you know, you really want to be a, a Travis Charest or a, or a Jim Lee or whatever it was from your generation. So you would practice the final product. And uh, getting back to your question, I think my big moment was storyboarding for television. I think uh, I started off doing a lot of commercials for um, uh, drunk driving, you know, uh, don't drink and drive. And the outcome of of doing this you know seeing how people might perish or, or or get arrested or things like that and so i had to incorporate a certain amount of action into my stick form uh -huh. and immediately um i was sort of successful with directors in that realm because i had this comic book cinematic background ah. and so the first few commercials i saw that were literally panel for panel uh -huh it blew my mind, you know? And then to sit in a cinema and see your name, you know, roll up the screen or to see a sequence that you uniquely worked on with the director one-on-one, -on -one, crafting how the camera's gonna move and how the actors are gonna interact with the space. Wow. Um, it was really eye-opening and I, actually, I, I went all in. You know, you buy your digital camera, <laughs> you fight for access to set so that you can take pictures of the environments if they're built or if they're uh, being rented. 
And uh, it just gives you more fodder to be able to tell that story properly. And then the rest is really uh, whether, I mean, in film and television, you're not, you're not working with the writer, you're working with the director or production designer and uh, really understanding their vision and what they want covered um, and how you can um, draw in a way, especially if you're doing action in a way that's safe for the actors, mm -hmm. you know, and um, the actual crew can understand what the parameters of that scene is, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of building props and staging and where are you gonna put the crew when we're shooting? Where are, we, are we all gonna hide behind this wall? Or are we gonna be in a park somewhere? And uh, you learn, um, you learn that your work has value on so many levels to different departments. Um, and I think the, the biggest realization for me was when I walked onto uh, a production stage and I saw my boards on the walls, just covering the walls. and they were circling what they were gonna do on that day Aww. and how they were gonna break down my shots. And often the director's so busy that you have to run this, right? Like Eric was saying, you're the director in a sense. Mm -hmm. That was another realization. This scene or this commercial is on your back because they trust that you understand the language of film and that mm -hmm. you can communicate this in a way that um, we've seen it before and unless there's any specific direction, like a, a camera that, that goes on forever or okay. any specific cuts uh, so you can show different elements in the scene, uh, it's on you. You are the director for the most part. So it was easy to be a, to shift over for you to be an award-winning director. <laughs> it was an easy shift because you're directing on paper, like Eric said. You're directing on paper. It's the same thing. Yeah, 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 that's awesome. What about you, Eric? What was your aha moment? What What was that moment that uh, brought it all together for you, seeing your work? Well, I think like seeing seeing your work, like the finished product of something that you've worked on for like you know weeks and months. You know whether you're seeing it on a on on the shelf of a store of a comic book store. Um, or you know, or or in a in a like I've I've done animatics for uh, like ads and things like that, but just seeing seeing the work finished and seeing people's reaction to it, and recognizing that um, like for me it's like that they that they appreciate what you do and that they they're trusting you with what you know whether whether it's you know whether with is whether it's their characters or again the you know selling this product uh or again just telling telling us that story that particular story um so when uh i guess it was when I, I was working with this writer, uh, L.A. Banks, uh, she she was writing a vampire huntress novel, graphic, uh, not not graphic novel, novel series. Mm -hmm. And I had I had moved back to Philadelphia. Um, I guess this was around 2004 or so. Um, but I, I was introduced to her at a uh, at a book signing. Um, it was it was it was L.A. Banks, Octavia Butler, Ooh. Anna Reeve Du, Stephen Barnes, um, uh, uh, what's the name? Samuel Delaney. Uh, it was it was the first time I'd ever even gone to a book signing. I, I actually before I before I went there, I didn't even know what a book signing was. I thought it was going to be people who had read their books, so like sitting around talking about their favorite parts of the book. I didn't, you know, so to find out that they were actually there, I was like, wow, okay. Um, so L.A. Banks and I, you know, we 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 made a connection because she uh, she lived here and she she lived in Philadelphia and actually she didn't live too far from me, but I I knew I wanted to put some visuals to uh, a novel. 
so and at first in going to the in going to the uh when I, when I found out that that auth that the authors were actually going to be at this signing I had at that point I had already read some of Octavia Butler's work and I was familiar with it and I was like oh I'm going to approach her about like maybe putting some visuals to to some of her novels I want to see Wild Seed but anyway go ahead well it that's coming oh, that's, I want to see that uh -huh. yeah but you know when I when I got to the signing and I saw just sat just seeing all of these authors on stage talking about their works, I you could see I, I well I could see that Octavia Butler was a, like she was painfully shy, and she spoke about that. She was very very shy, and but like L. A. Banks was like so gregarious and you know just like just you know just again she just had this other energy, so I was like I think I might have a better chance of like approaching her and i did and so um realizing that you know she was writing these prose novels about you know vampires and things um putting together like character drawings for them yeah. you know we had to be very very careful because when when you when you read a a a, a prose novel you're picturing everybody's everybody's picturing the scenes in a different way they're they're picturing their versions of like say you know whatever the whatever the protagonists and the antagonists you know what they look like mm -hmm. so um that that she trusted me to kind of with basically i mean these were her characters these were her stories but you know to me it felt like she was trusting me it was like she was trusting me with her babies mm -hmm. you know? so i was like i had to be very careful and intentional about how i approached the visuals to to you know to creating these visuals for these stories because once they're once once we put them out you know people are well you know they they she had an event she had a uh, one of her, one of her one of the novels was was coming out, and she had a big event here in Philadelphia where like readers were coming in from all over for this this big event. It was like a it was like a weekend event. Like she had rented a bus to like take readers around to like different sites in the books. Oh wow! You know there was there was gonna be a slumber party. It was, again, it was, it was a big big thing. So. Um, this, the first night, you know, they had a, uh, you know, she had rented out a, uh, she had, yeah, rented out a, a restaurant, you know, where everybody, all the, all the, all of the readers were gonna, you know, come in, you know, meet and, you know, just, you know, talk about the books and everything. So anyway, I get there, and one of the readers was like, "Hey, you drew, like, so the, one of the protagonists, the, the main protagonist in her novels uh, was a character na uh, named Damali, the uh, vampire huntress." She was like, you you drew well. Damali's, I guess, uh, love interest was was his name was Carlos, and she was like, this one of the readers was like, hey, you drew Carlos like you know looking like this, but I pictured that's not the way that I pictured him. And again, it's like at that point, it's like interpretation. Yeah, it's it's all interpretation. But again, once 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 the drawing is out there, you know, once the visual is out there, you know readers have to sh kind of shift their 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 what yeah. you know what they thought into what what they're seeing now right so you know it's like again it's like the translation of 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 books of novels to movies you know it's like well what in the book you know in the book the, the writer describes uh Tyrion Lannister as you know having blonde hair and you know all this kind of stuff and then you see the actor in say in the, in the Game of Thrones series, and it's like, well, okay, there there's some similar similarities, but then you know, again, there's there's always going to be a difference. Yeah. And you know, you try to explain, you know, why you made certain decisions and uh, why you know, again, why you chose certain elements to include and certain elements to like you know omit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but again, I you know, I don't I don't know if I did I answer your question. I'm just rambling. But you, you, made a, you made a great point because artists don't always know what's involved in working with licensed characters. Right? Creative, Whether, license, the creative license, you mean? Well, uh, no, just a company or, or, or um, 
or an individual that owns a character that created it. And so it has its own visual language. It has its own identity out there in the real world. And people expect the characters to look and sound exactly as they were read on the page or as they look, if it's Batman or it's Superman or whoever it is. Um, and so I think it really doesn't matter what medium you're in. Um, if you go into uh, an atmosphere, a job atmosphere where you're dealing with licensed work, you have to draw to the specifications of the estate or the company or um, the art director. Uh -huh. You know, and sometimes they set the pace. This is how the lines are going to look. And this is, can you morph into my style? That sounds you know? stressful. Well, that's, that's, that's not, that's animation, right? <laughs> that's not, I mean, that sounds stressful. I mean, to have to, to have to follow the, 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 the Batman, the Spider-Man that you grew up with <laughs> because, because he has transformed and gotten more hip and modern from, from the comic books back in the, you know, maybe the sixties, seventies, eighties, whatever. Um, so that just sounds stressful having to stay in, in that realm, as opposed to having the freedom. Like, what is that behind you? Was that your, was that your freedom, Eric, to, to, to totally do this character behind you? I see well, Charlie that, Parker on one side and. <laughs> oh yeah. So, okay. So that's John Coltrane. And, oh, Coltrane. Uh, yeah. I did that for an organi organization called the Philadelphia Jazz Project. Oh, you drew that? Yes. Oh, wow. I thought that was a poster. Cool. Oh yeah. They turned it into a flag. Because they, they had uh, they had events going on around the city. That is so, cool. Right. That is awesome. But um, but like this. I saw it on your Insta page. It was incredible. Ah, thanks. But like, so this is one of the draw. This is one of the drawings that I did of L.A. Banks's characters, and that's that's the Molly and Carlos. So now, how, how do you think about something like that? Like what? <laughs> I mean, that is like, where do you have to go on your brain to pull out that type of monster? It, well, it's 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 not hard. That's the thing. Cause <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a you know I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of horror stories and like you know I, again just always reading Alfred Hitchcock and uh, like you know reading Stephen King and all of those things. Like the scarier the better for me, you know. Um, but wow. going back to something that Jose said in terms of uh, like drawing licensed characters, like with animation, yeah, you're 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 drawing um, the characters in a specific style for for that animation. But the, the, the great thing about a character like Batman or Spider-Man, when you're drawing comic books, their, their outlines and their, their costume designs are so um, are so iconic that every every artist can draw Batman, and as long as you see that silhouette, and you, as long as you see the bat ears, you know who it is. No matter, no matter wh whether the you know it's an ab you know an abstract painting of Batman, or you know it's like you're gonna recognize his silhouette. Uh, you're gonna recognize the Spider-Man webbing and you know eyes and everything. So you know whether an artist draws in a cartoony style, whether he draws in a realistic style. There are that that's the, that's the importance of the the design elements that go into creating characters, and again that get, that goes into the graphic design parts and the the fashion design parts, because in creating characters you wanna you wanna try to figure out elements of creating a character that are going to to, to make it stand out and be different from everything else that you've that you've seen out there, and there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, so like uh, the other day, I was I was watching that movie, um, the Tomorrow War. Um, uh, was it Chris? Uh, uh, what's his last name? Chris. The the Pratt. guy. Yeah, Chris Pratt. Oh, but like, I mean, it's you know, it's an it's an okay movie, but like for me, the 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 the, the design of the creatures is just oh, they're just fantastic. So I mean, I can, I can, I, you know, and I put that movie on mute just to like, you know, every time while I'm drawing, I'm looking up and as long as I'm seeing those creatures, I'm just like, man, those are incredible. Because of the, again, when you look at the- Meanwhile, I'm turning the channel because I don't like <laughs> and creatures. <laughs> you know what we used to do back in the day? We used to, um, we used to record movies on cassettes. And back when I had my school, 
we would just put the cassette tape, you mm -hmm. know, in a boom box and listen to aliens <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Or our favorite movie or the exorcist or whatever it is. And we learned really early on that sound plays a huge, huge Absolutely. part in communicating how to communicate that visually. Um, you, you see how directors use uh, strobe lights and a siren in the background. It may be yeah. light, but it's droning. Yeah. And you try and communicate that through 2D illustration as best you can. Yeah. Um, but if you get a chance to incorporate that through other mediums to amalgamate sound and lighting, and you can build tension and mood yeah. and pacing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think Eric was, was, was talking about uh, a lot of really cool elements of character design and strong silhouettes, mm -hmm. which is a part of the, the process of building characters, right? Just having a really iconic silhouette that you can, you can fill out, mm -hmm. you know, based on a character's personality and their occupation and their life history and mm. figure out a way to have that character connect somehow on some level with their audience right so, that, so so that's interesting so you would put yourself when you're drawing maybe put the music on for inspiration mm -hmm. certain type that's of music right. yeah that's putting yourself yeah because it, it's a, sometimes space. it sets you in a mood you know it gives you uh if, if it's a dire mood or a, uh, a pensive mood or an action-packed sort of adrenaline filled rush that you're going through where you may be using speed lines ah. to communicate something. Uh, you may draw less backgrounds and concentrate more on the character motion. And so your line of motion is more fluid. You know, you want to, you want to show um, large impacts and, and, uh, and sweeping motion in, in a sense. Um, and then when it's a quiet moment, maybe you want to, maybe you want to push in and have something, that's Orchestra. close up and a little more diluted in the background so we get a sense of the the emotional currency that's at play you know hmm. one of the things i wish i could talk to y'all forever but i know y'all have to <laughs> 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 can you believe an hour is up and I, and I still haven't asked you like I, there's just two things so i wanted to know one are there some bucket list projects that you want to produce or is there anything you're working on now now that you can talk about that you're excited about because eric's always like oh i'm so busy i'm so busy <laughs> so there's some things coming in is there anything you can talk about or anything that you really want to do yourself in terms of creating and and um instead of drawing somebody else's book but your own thing i mean is there is that is that in the in the orbit <laughs> well there's, there's always like there's not enough time in a day. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, we're at such an amazing point in history, creatively, and because of the, you know, the state of affairs with the pandemic um, and the internet that, that really raised the bar. I mean, when the internet popped up, I was posting my artwork on like 14, 15 sites. It took like six, seven hours a day, you know? and that self-marketing and um, social media aspect is, is really allowed us to raise our game and connect with our our uh, potential future partners and things like that so that we can collaborate on projects that we care about. Um, so on my end, a lot of those collaborations are leading towards or leaning, yeah, I should say leaning towards um, the stuff I love, film, short film. I have a, a bunch of stuff on my docket. Um, that I'm putting through through my company. I'm producing some scripts for some uh, Canadian broadcasters up here. Um, I'd love to dip more heavily into, and this is the ultimate aim, um, working with volume stages, you know, these new stages that are being built all over the country. You have tons of them on your side of the border. We have a few up here where you can make productions like The Mandalorian, and bring a 3D space, a 3D aspect to your filming uh, and actually use the backlighting of these stages to inform your characters and your mood. Uh, so that's something I'm really excited about um, telling stories in, in that digital space. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, audio, 
figuring out how to create stories in, in an audio space that allows me to maximize um, what I'd like to think is a model that most large companies are leaning in towards, which is the transmedia model, being able to have a comic book and a film and a, a web series and maybe an audio series that take into, a, take into account different aspects of the story mm-hmm. that you're trying to tell or from different perspectives. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Basically, the transmedia outlook. Yeah. Exciting. What about you, Mr. Battle? Both of y'all have like famous last names. Captain Battle Opera and Jeffrey Holder. I mean, Nothing might, beats might be Battle. There. Hey. Nothing beats Battle. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thank my mother. Um, but uh, well, so uh, for the past, uh, I'd say two years or so, I've been working on Blam. Uh, I I sent. Uh, I, thank I, you. For, I got mine. Yay! Yes, that's awesome. Um, so with with is uh, Black Lives Always Mattered, Hidden African American Philadelphia of the 20th Century, um, I I was brought in to uh, curate and art direct uh, this graphic novel, and it gave me the opportunity to work with other illustrators and writers whose work again I that I admired for a long long time. So that we actually have it in hand, um, you know, I'm just it's a, a lot of a lot of really exciting things have uh, been transpiring since you know since we have the book uh, published. Now it's we have it up on Amazon. Now we have it up up on Temple's website. I uh, have a, a number of different um, events coming up that are featuring featuring the book. Uh, so I'm excited about all of those. And again, always hoping that this will be the first of many more. So at, at some point, I'm hoping to like be able to like reach out to more artists um, to tell to tell more stories. Um, you do like a series of, of, of extended to a series of books. Yeah, because the thing is, like you know, so this this book, you know, it it just it features 14 African Americans from Philadelphia, but I mean the list the list that that we had we 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 whittled it down to 14, but there's so many. And the the reality we you can do this kind of thing in in every city, you know, because there are always there are people you know everywhere who are doing incredible things in in their in their respective cities. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you know that's that's out now. Again, I'm working on the the graphic novel project with uh, John Jennings Megascope uh, um, imprint. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'm excited about it because it's, it's honestly like one of the most, I'd say, important projects of my career. It's like, you know, I've, I've, I've had fun drawing Batman and Spider-Man and those characters, but this, uh, I'm drawing, uh, I'm, the, the graphic novel is, is the, is, is the story of Emmett Till, and I mean, you know, that's. It's such a, you know, we 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 know the story, but you know, putting it in visual form and you know, with with the information that I have, and the writer is uh, Christopher Benson. He's he was the lawyer who got the case reopened. Mm. So, you know, I'm working on that again. Really, really excited, um, and you know, juggling juggling a couple of other a, a, a couple of other projects, but you know, though. Those are the main things going on right now. Um, I'll, I'll probably like so. <laughs> another couple of hours, I've got to make a decision on a project uh, with DC. Couple of hours, ooh. Yeah, so, yeah, again, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> right, but yeah, like you say though, that, you know, there's there's only you know there's not enough time. There's not enough time in the day, and it's like. You know, you want to do you want to do everything, and you want to do it all, but you want you know you want to do it well. Yeah. Um, so you know, we'll you know. Just One of the things. Do. Thank you for that. One of the things that I was thinking that two things that are really important for kids and youth and just aspiring illustrators that are watching. Um, one is 
can you talk about, I mean, your value now, you, you know, your value now. And so to let them know that there, there, there's a price point, I mean, in terms of what you bring in, what you're making, how do they know, get to the point where they know their value? It, what is the range of what they should be targeting for in terms of pay for an illustrator? Things like that are important because a lot of times people think that their particular skill of drawing is not valuable or not valued and they can't make a living out of it. They can't survive off of it. But you, you two have seemed to have gone through your struggles and now you're at a point where there's challenges more so, but you're, you're able to meet them and, and get projects in without, you don't have agents, do you? Without agents and all that stuff. I don't. It's just coming to you. So it's just word of mouth pretty much at this stage in your life. Yeah. That you I think for most, um, I guess respected or, or um, most illustrators who are in demand. I mean, at some point you create a client base that you rely on and uh, you have to have faith that your work is uh, up to snuff and they'll tell you, I think the market will define for the most part when you're ready or not. And that's why I think it's so important to find your community, whether it's in film or it's in television or video games, whatever it is. Um, it's never been easier. You don't have to go all the way across the country or, uh, you know, abroad to find out what's happening in your market. What are the new um, uh, books coming out? What are the new uh, IPs? What studios or imprints are now about to pop? Um, and just figuring out how to communicate with those people, uh, how to be respectful, how to present yourself in a, in a particular way. Um, there's certain unwritten rules, you know, to have a portfolio online. I think it's really important. Um, I'm always bringing people into the industry and I'm always sort of shocked when I come across someone who doesn't know that they should have an online portfolio or maybe a, a presence, a social media presence of some sort, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, uh, to be able to make it easier for other people to find you to use your actual name your full name mm -hmm. um to represent yourself properly and uh to sort of like bridge the gap between a very solitary uh, uh job description that we have mm -hmm. and, and make it more sociable so you don't feel like all of the world's plights are on you you know okay. you, you have to understand how to navigate it um and maybe how to set up uh, a circle of friends and family that support you and uh, give you that motivation to move on to the next step in your career. Because there's nothing that can take the air out of your, your sales faster than negativity. A rejection. It's a rejection. Well, rejection is part of the game. Yeah. Um, but negativity, I mean, uh, as an art director or as, or as a director, as anyone who leads other artists, you understand the importance of momentum. Momentum is everything. There's nothing like taking a person's work and not giving it a constructive feedback and picking at it for various reasons. And really what you're doing is picking at the, uh, the soul of the artist. They, they'll draw more into themselves and maybe be less likely to have some sort of creative liberty in the work. So understanding how to work with different people in the spaces is, is, is really, really important, I'd say. Okay. I'm worried about you. Like be, be, uh, know your industry and be professional, uh, yeah. meet your deadlines. Um, and you know, again, doing, doing, doing those things so that, you know, uh, recognizing when, if an art director or editor, when they reach out to you, they recognize your value, but you need to be able to recognize your value right so in terms of like pricing and those sorts of things you know there there are books out there there's there's a book that's printed i think they print it every year or every, every other y'all aren't unionized are you there, there are no unions up here for for artists per se but i know uh, for storyboard artists in the states there's a union oh okay. i didn't know that okay i'm sorry eric go ahead i'm sorry um, but yeah, there, there are books, there's, uh, there's a, there's an illustrator's, uh, ethical guidelines and price, like 
you know, it, it, it tells you how to like how to price different types of work. Uh, but again, you, you just need to know your know your industry, be professional. Um, don't be afraid to ask for what you what you want, but you've got to be able to gauge your own work. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, honestly, you got to be honest with yourself to like to know whether it stands up to the stuff that's already out there. Mm. Um, you know, it's so like part of being an artist and like kind of like being able to accept criticism and not let criticism like completely defeat you. You kind of have a you kind you you need a you need to have a healthy skin, uh, a healthy a healthy ego, <laughs> in a sense. Again, to like it be like okay, and and realize everybody's not gonna like what you do. Everybody's not gonna like your work, and that's okay. Um, the thing is, nowadays with the internet. Again, it's made it easier for people to find their audience mm -hmm. and recognize that somebody's looking for what you're doing and it's easier to connect with those people who are looking for what you're doing, but you have to do it, you know, because, you know, it's like, and again, that's, that, that goes into recognizing what goes into this work. It's, it's hard work. You know, it looks fun. It looks fun, you know, when it's when it's, you know, when it's in front of you. But like getting the work, you know, taking the work from an idea to a script to a finished piece, you know, it's it's a it's hard work. So, you know, like, uh, you know, teach, you know, telling kids, you know, again, and it's, it's a job. It's a job, too. It's a career. It's a job that can turn into a career. Um, but you have to do the work. I'd like to add something you were saying there. Um, after you've done everything Eric has said, um, I think it's important for artists to understand uh, the pipeline of the types of mediums that they're applying to mm -hmm. and to reverse engineer those pipelines. Um, often what I'll, what I'll see- Break that down. Right okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's, let's run it back. Often what I'll see in portfolios or what I'll hear in requests is I'd like to get into X market. What do I need? What do I need to have represented in my, in my portfolio? Um, and hopefully they say portfolio. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so in comic books, obviously it's a span of, uh, of a few pages that has different elements maybe uh, a quiet moment, an action moment, uh, showing some background and a, 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 an appreciation for backgrounds as well as for characterization, emotional currency, facial expressions, things like that. Um, maybe an understanding of, of light and shadow, uh, you might say, Eric, um, and really getting a sense of a beginning, a middle and an end. I think it's very important to tell a story in those pages. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, video games, the pipeline is completely different, and you may need to specialize and focus on what area of that market you want to enter. So, is it characters? Is it backgrounds? Is it environments? Is it um, animation? Is it rigging? Is it you know what I mean? Is it uh, texturing? So, if it's characters, then you have to show the types of uh, what what art, art directors would expect from you coming into the industry? Silhouettes, um, different uh, types of color, uh, design work, um, maybe uh, different types of variations on a theme. I think mm -hmm. that's very important. They need to see how your, your mental process is, mm -hmm. um, putting together a character, uh, maybe what your references are, what your underpinnings, your your sketching or or line work is um are you photo bashing are you taking reference from different spots and making something mm -hmm. are you using 3d software to inform your your backgrounds or your character models whatever they are mm -hmm. uh, you have to understand those pipelines and before you enter that craft um understand that the people 
who are experts in that field will judge you based on that expertise that you bring. So character artists will judge a character artist. Environmental artists will judge, you know, and so on and so on. So you need to figure out what that pipeline is um, and understand that, uh, like, I'll give you another example. In storyboarding, um, I didn't know coming in that I could work for the agency side or I could work for the production house side. And I learned early on that the structure would be an agency would uh, receive a pitch from like a McDonald's or a Walmart uh, for a commercial. It would be written. It might be illustrated from an illustrator in the agency. Mm -hmm. And then that pitch goes out to several production houses and a director selected in each of those production houses will do their version of that commercial. And so you might be one of the artists uh, selected to pair up with a director to do that version. And if you're lucky enough and it's a small enough industry, what you'll find happening is you get, uh, you actually get double booked. Like you'll be on the same commercial with, you know what I mean? Two, two houses. So you learn different aspects of the medium. Um, and with storyboarding, it's about speed and communicating a vision mostly through realism. There's not much space for a lot of um, uh, embellishment because people eat with their eyes first <clears throat> mm -hmm. and they want to be able to understand what it is based on their world, the, the real world. So yes, reverse engineering what you want to do and then finding people in that medium to tell you what's expected, um, how long it should take, um, and maybe based on your skill set, what you can charge at that stage of your career. Um, it doesn't make sense to ask a professional who's done something for 20 years, what's your rate? Or 10 years or 15 years? Um, because you have to build up to that. You know. Um, and the last thing I would say to this point is that with technology being what it is, um, I noticed this transition happening in comic books really early the all-in-one artist. A lot of companies outside of the big two um, were expecting an artist to be able to pencil, ink, and sometimes color their own work. And that changes the rate. It changes your speed. It changes your focus on each aspect. Um, in video games, you can't just draw line work. I mean, you have to be able to offer more value. Hmm. Um, so that you're not in this sort of contractual abyss. Can you paint? Can you do a little, a little 3D? You know what I mean? Can you sculpt? Whatever it is, it adds to your value, and um, you can create a career out of that. Hmm. You know? Wow, this has been amazing. How can people reach you? Is that through Stillwalker Productions? For me, it's Stillwalker. Uh, productions or oh thanks it popped up right there or um or i'm on social media all the way across can i throw a, a quick shout out to some of the stuff i'm working on yeah i'm gonna edit some stuff in but yeah go ahead all right all right so um i have a book coming out with aftershock comics you got you got you can hold it up can you hold it up or yeah no? yeah actually i got my comps just the other day so that's the cover last um, line last so line it's by aftershock written by Richard Dinnick, um, myself on the art chores, and uh, Kelly Fitzpatrick on the color, and Dave Sharp on the uh, on the line. So this is the type of madness you'll get a chance to And that's enjoy. on Amazon? Um, you could get it uh, online. You could get it at a local comic book shop. Uh, I would suggest going to aftershockcomics.com to, to figure out where you might be able to order it. And on the side, Mm -hmm. My main job, my nine to five, mm -hmm. um, I'm a senior uh, concept illustrator for Warner Brothers Games, and we're about to launch Gotham Knights. Ah! ah! So, wait, 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 wait. I can't wrap my head. <laughs> well, Malcolm X game? No, no. <laughs> Gotham Knights. Gotham Knights. It's the next in the Batman video game franchise, and this focuses on the what we call the orphans all of the the four main characters that batman has has really helped shape 
um, their careers and oh, their. I'm tripping. I would, my, I went somewhere else. <laughs> I'm like, that's making gaming. But okay, that would be cool. Fantasy cool. World. Woo. Okay. So October twenty uh, first is when that game they, launches. Where can they look for that? Where can people? Is it just? Gonna oh, be... you're going to be able to buy that anywhere. It'll be all in their face. Go on, oh. Yeah, you could buy that. In, you know, in stores, you can buy that online. I know it'll be on Xbox or PS five. And uh, October twenty first. That's the big day. Oh, that's the same month of our, as, 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 well, yeah, our festival October. So. That's it. That's it. It's a busy month. Yes. So, say, is the is the the book that you did with uh, AfterShock is that out yet, or is that when is that coming out? That's coming out uh, this month. So later this month, you'll be able to to find Which it. Which is the month of September? September. Yeah. We're recording this, and then we're gonna play this in October. So cool. Awesome. Awesome. So it would it would have already been out, and you can enjoy. It's it's part of a four issue series that I'm working on with them. So. Yeah, that's and exciting. Then, you were working with Mike Martz on that, right? That's right. Nice, nice. The infamous Mike Martz. I remember sending him envelopes when he was at Marvel, <laughs> and now I'm working with him. Awesome. Um, as an editor, and he's, in he's Toronto. I mean, in Montreal, and that's in Montreal, you, you and he's in the states. Yeah. Yeah. Beauty of it. Nice. God bless the internet. Very. Yes. Yes. Well, this how Eric. Where can people reach you? Um, I guess like I, 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 I know you don't have time. You y'all need y'all need virtual assistance. Like <laughs> true. true. Like uh, hello. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I have a Facebook page and an Instagram, you know, so I you know I'll I'll pop up on there every now and then. But um what's your what's your Instagram handle? Uh battle lines are drawn. B A T T L E lines. Yeah. A R E or just R? Just R, just the letter R. R drawn. Drawn. That name keeps on giving. It just keeps on giving. <laughs> Thanks to your mom, man. Thanks to your mom. Battle lines are drawn. I like that. Yeah, that it, it, there is a lot you can do with that. Yeah. I love it. Well, gentlemen, this has been, I don't know if y'all realize it, but we went over 30 minutes, but I just couldn't stop. <laughs> I was just like, let's get well past this. Minutes, yes. so much. This has been wonderful. And the great thing is that, you know, children and, and just aspiring illustrators, youth students are going to be watching this. And I think that they will be very inspired by what you're doing, what you're contributing, the legacy you're leaving behind for, uh, for them to continue to pick up and keep it moving. So thank you, and um, God, I wish y'all could y'all could come this way. Maybe another festival, another year. We'll come back to animation in black. Sounds um, good. Sounds good. Yes. But we're looking forward to seeing all that's that's coming, all that's ahead. Um, so you all have a blessed rest of your um, week, and all the best with moving forward with the projects you're working on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes. You're welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure.